Hi, my name's Amanda Subasado and I'm from the Young Deadly Free team. And today we're speaking with two clinicians about how they support clients to access sexual health services and encourage behaviour change in different clinical settings. First up, we have Dr Amy, who works in the dedicated sexual health service, Shine SA. In your experience, um, what do you think some of the core principles are around um, supporting clients, particularly in the sexual health? Mm. I think the first thing uh, to understand is that people are often not uh, wanting to change. They're actually happy with their behaviours and still you know, getting some sort of um, pleasure or benefit from them. So uh, supporting them to make changes often involves um, helping them to understand that whilst they might enjoy certain behaviours, that those behaviours aren't good for them. Um, it's also really important, particularly with sexual health, not to be judgmental. Um, the moment people start to sense that you might be judging them or disapproving of them, they will pull back and stop disclosing things to you. So it is more about um, getting them to see the risks that they're taking, the potential sort of long-term impacts of that. How important do you think it is having a, a good relationship and rapport with the client is in terms of supporting them? In terms of helping people change, it's really important. Um, so if you don't have that kind of rapport, again, people will sort of not want to tell you things, um, not want to take your advice. Um, sometimes it's good for people who just want to come in for a quick checkup, not to know the person that they're seeing, but in general, if it's about long-term behavioural change, then having an ongoing relationship. Um, often it takes several visits before they'll actually trust you enough to tell you something. So, for example, uh, disclosing their sexual orientation is something that they might have been, you know, assessing you in previous consults as to how you're going to react to them. What is your role then as a clinician, particularly as a GP, because um, we're going to be speaking to sort of a nurse later on, in terms of supporting the clients to make change? As a GP it can be difficult, um, often you've got a 10 or 15 minute window um, to help people, so it's about brief interventions, so sometimes it's just about asking the question every time, you know, have you thought about using condoms more regularly? Um, and they might say no on that day, but the next time you see them you ask the question again and eventually they might say, well look, tell me more more about it and you know then you might be able to take a bit more time to to flesh things out. Great so it sounds like um, what you're doing is really following their lead. Yes. Do you have any examples you can share about um, how you supported somebody in making some changes? I see a lot of uh, younger women and um, the first thing I say to them because they're often a little bit you know shy and they worried how I'm going to react and I say it's not that I don't care if you're having sex you're allowed to have sex, but I want you to have good sex. So not only is it safe, but it's also fun for you. So, you know, people who are in coercive relationships or having sex because they feel pressure to often aren't enjoying sex. And I think that's really important. And I'll see them sort of go, oh, okay, it's okay to talk about this stuff with this person. Um, I think it's really important to utilise your support network. So a lot of um, general practices will have a nurse and certainly a lot of remote communities will have the health worker. So if someone says, yeah, I would actually like to talk to someone a bit more about this then you might be able to say look I've got my next patient but can I get you to come and talk to such and such and that person's generally got time to talk to them about it. Mm. What for you would be some cues or indicators or do you have some examples around? Yeah body language is really important um, if you start to talk to someone about something they don't want to talk about they'll often lean back or cross their arms um, whereas if you sort of mention something uh, that someone might be interested in you can always see them sort of prick up their ears and so again they'll, they'll lean in so to say for example do you want to talk about the different kinds of contraception someone might say oh yeah actually I've been wondering about what I should be doing. Mm, yeah. 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 So non-verbal and verbal yeah. cues. Yeah. Yep. Can you just explain to us the importance of um, the work that you do being client-centred and the impact, I guess, of it if it isn't. Yeah, so sometimes we talk about um, people's agendas, so when you've got a GP and a patient in the room together, they've each got their own agenda mm. and so the GP's agenda might be, um, okay, this person's come in to do this, um, I'm not going to talk about anything else and the other person's agenda is, I've come in saying that I want to talk about this but what I'm actually waiting to see is whether I can actually talk more about this. So mm. if you don't allow them to do that, then they, again, they won't tell you. So if you sort of, if they start to talk about something and you shut them down, they won't bring it up again. Mm. Um, and if you try and ask too many questions about something they don't want to talk about, they'll shut you down and again, they won't want to come back to see you. So, you know, if you ask about, you know, who are you, are you sexually active and they clearly don't want to talk to you about it, if you start keep asking them questions, 
they won't develop that rapport. Mm. If they say, look, I don't want to talk about that today, then, then you can acknowledge that and say, that's fine. But if you do ever want to talk to me about it, I'm here. And so mm. leaving that door open for them. Thank you for your time, Amy. We're now going to have a look at some role plays to showcase how to put the information and the skills that we've just talked about into practice. So I'd like you to stay off that knee for a couple of days and then it should be all fine. Um, but since you're here, would you like to get a checkup for sexually transmitted infections? It's really common for people under 30 to have one and not know about it. If, if you're interested, I can give you this pot. You can take it to the toilet now while I finish up your paperwork. Excellent. There you go. Thank you for that. I'll be sending that off for a test for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Some other STI testing we could do would be a blood test for things like HIV, hepatitis or syphilis. Is that something you'd be interested in? Okay, look, if you're not interested in that today, just you can come back any time if you, if you change your mind. For your results, why don't we get you to come back and have a chat to one of our male health workers and then if you have any other questions, you can talk to him about it. Okay. Great, excellent. Well, we'll see you soon. We now have uh, Noreen Conlon with us, who is a very experienced uh, nurse. So welcome, Noreen. What some of the core principles are in supporting our clients to make changes to their sexual risk taking? It's really important um, as a core principle is just respect, is to really honour and respect the person and their ability to actually make sense of the information. And so one of the principles would be always ensure that the information you're giving across, get a sense of how it's being interpreted. Mm, Take mm. the time to do that. The other thing I always think, if you're walking alongside people, it's not that heavy responsibility be, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. You know, like you haven't got a responsibility for them to change. You've got a responsibility to deliver good information so that they understand it and they can make decisions on it. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of the care being client-centred? You, you touched on it mm. a, a bit. I think all sexual health, you need to centre it from the client because, in, because of many reasons, sexual health will remain private. And it doesn't matter about culture, language or anything. A person or person's own development in their own sexual being is a, a private journey for them. And when people come in and say, oh, you know, I ended up, I got completely pissed and I ended up having, I don't know how much sex I had. And I said, oh, okay, but you're here. You're here, good on you. Really reinforce that because a lot of young people get a lot of negativity at them. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, yeah, well, if they're gonna go off and have sex, you're not judging that. Mm. You, you're really skilling them up. Sexual health is all about relationship building, even with your clients and that, or with your community, with your organisation, so it's all about that. So it sounds like you're just saying the, uh, a key thing around yarning about sexual health is having that good rapport and relationship, not just with the individual when we're talking about Aboriginal sexual health, but also mm. with the community. Yeah. How did you go about building some of those relationships? So a lot of it is just going with, with the community out in remote areas and, and this is good in any ways to go to the elders first and give the information that you'd like to be talking about and then get the feedback from them about how that should actually go about. In a lot of communities they'd already identified that they wanted to have stuff so then you'd, you'd be going and it's about being in a community, being available, being able to get the let them get the feel of you so they can trust you and then you will get all the questions that you need to find out the answers to. Yeah and the skills is also what's really important when we're talking about well any behaviour change um, it's not just about information is it? No nah, and it's practicing the skill so if I was doing a pap smear on somebody the first thing I'd say is who's the boss of your body and they'd say oh me and I said yeah so if at any time I have to stop you have to tell me so that puts control right back onto them and they're practicing why I really did that quite a lot is that I wanted them to practice saying no I'm the boss as a practitioner I felt that I you know gave them that window of being assertive about their body within a professional context and who knows the potential impact of allowing them to do that when there's that power imbalance for the yeah. clinician and community member yeah, when they're going out into their Because that's sex. often what happens within um, unconsented sex. It's a power and difference, isn't it? Mm. 
thinking about STI testing as an example. Yep. Can you maybe describe to us some of the things that people need in order to get tested and access testing? When you're looking at the testing is that there's some very good visuals around how to actually take a swab. And it is actually, if a person's never taken a swab before, it is well worth you getting the swabs, taking them out, showing them what they actually have to do, how far it needs to go up, um, and going through the actions and then they can go off to the toilet and that they can actually do it themselves. Mm, that's the skills again. Yeah. yeah, so it is about skills. It's about us working alongside and building on up, not about getting frustrated because we needed to get all this done. Thank you for your time, Noreen. We're now going to have a look at uh, a last role play, showcasing again uh, some of the things that Noreen's just talked about. Well, if you like to go off to the toilet, you can actually take a test there. So all you need to do is with the urine, when you do a bit of a wee, just catch the first part of the urine and you only need to fill it up, just even up to there, okay? Radio. So do that one and females, another thing that we can do is do a swab because it makes it a bit more accurate. So have you done a swab before? No? Okay. Well, you've got to put it in your vagina area. So if I was just looking at this, what you're wanting to do, this is your vagina, okay? So when we do a wee, we're doing it out here this end one and then this is where we're having sex so this is where the penis goes in and has it. So I'm just going to go in and do a swab in there and the easy way to remember it, I always say it's easier to put your leg up on the on the toilet in there, it's a bit awkward for us, hey? you know what I mean and then you just need to put it in and it only needs to go up that much so the first part of your finger so you can't put it up too far so don't worry. Do you reckon that's okay or is it, yeah? Any questions on that? Thank you for joining us. We hope this video gave you some practical advice. We also encourage you to speak with your local public health unit, sexual health team or family planning organisation for further information and training.